chapter 9. Thank you, Megan. Now, I want you to hear the message tonight, and you might think, well, this doesn't really apply to me, and uh, it only applies for a few that uh, have got young children and so forth. But I want you to hear, because as while we're away, I was reading through the Gospel of Mark and this passage of Scripture, the Lord just grabbed me with it, started thinking about this passage and uh, just wrote a few notes down and then believe the Lord wanted me to preach tonight. And tonight what I want to preach on is this subject, distraught parents and troubled teens. Distraught parents and troubled teens. Now, <laughs> there's already smiles in in the congregation, yes, we know what that's all about. Um, I, I wish everyone was here to hear it, but you're here by divine appointment, amen? amen? So I'm sure God will give you something out of the message. If you found your place, let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse number 14. And it's a lengthy reading, so if you have to sit down, please do so. But it begins in verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them, and straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child, and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And let's have a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. And Lord, we're going to look at a passage that is very familiar probably to most of us. But God, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds, open our eyes that we may understand and perceive what you're saying and make application today. God, we live in a day where parents are really struggling in their home and, and teenagers and children are, are battling and... Uh, Lord, a lot of parents are distraught and, and really don't know what to do, but God, there is an answer. And of course, that answer is found in you, Lord. And I pray that tonight that you would just again speak to our hearts. And some of us here have got grown children and some have got grandchildren but, and some have got younger children. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would take something and give it to each person that's Amen. here today. Yes. And so, God, we want to thank and praise you. Thank you for this opportunity again. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When I read this, I felt so much for this father as he besought the disciples to help him out with his child and the hopeless and helpless situation that this father felt. Now, I don't know whether you've ever felt as a parent, you've seen your child, whether young child or an older child, going through something and you felt so helpless and hopeless in being able to help them with where they're at. Uh, I feel that even for our kids who are adults, there are some things that, uh, that I've said to Tracy that I, I'm burdened about with my children and there's nothing I can do about it. Have you ever felt that where you felt there's nothing I can do 
for my child. And this is where this, par- this parent here, this father is at right now. He's got this son and I, uh, I believe he's a teenager. And the way I, what, reason why I believe he's a teenager is because number one, I'm preaching the message. <laughs> so I think he's a teenager. Number two, when Jesus questioned him how long it is ago since it came, he said, as of a child. So I, I've sort of hedged my bets as far as I don't think really that he would be an adult. I would say rather he'd probably be in his teenage years. I'm, I'm not, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's just how I see it. He's brought his son to him and uh, uh, he's a teenager and uh, he's come to the disciples. The disciples could do nothing for him. They couldn't cast out the demon. The father's distraught and, and, he's, and he's seen the Lord. He's come running to the Lord and... Uh, he's weeping, he's crying, he's, uh, he's feeling helpless and hopeless and he beseeches the Lord Jesus Christ to help him with where he's at. Now let me just say this, uh, have you ever felt that you've gone to your pastor for something and the pastor just couldn't help you with it? And if you haven't yet, just hang on because there'll be something that Pastor Marsh and I will just not be able to do for you. All right. There are some things in life that we don't have the answers to. You have to go to Jesus yourself. And you have to beseech the Lord yourself. Pastors are not know-it-alls, though there are some that like probably think they are. We're not know-it-alls, all right? We don't know everything. We know some things, and if there's something we don't know, we'll pray about it and try and get an answer from the Lord. But here... The the father went to the disciples, the ministers that we heard this morning, the the, uh, preachers in training, and they couldn't help him out. But there's always one who can. Amen. And his name is Jesus. And so the father goes to the Lord Jesus Christ and we see it there. And of course, there's that classic statement in verse 23. If thou canst believe all things are possible to him who believe. And of course, that, that statement has so... Far, wide-reaching, probing applications. We apply that to everything in life, don't we? If we can believe all things are possible to him who believeth. And there is, a, there is an application for that for everything. But the interpretation or the, uh, the context, sorry, of what it's saying is a distraught parent seeking the Lord on behalf of his child. And Jesus says to the parent, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You may not be able to do anything for your child, but believe Jesus Christ for them. Amen. Now, let me just say this. You can't even save them. You can't save them. Only Jesus can save. You can believe God that God can work in their heart and do something. You can pray for them. You can witness to them and and all of that. You can do that, but you can't save them. You can't heal them. You can't, uh, if they've got problems in their life, you can't fix the problem. And we all as parents want to fix the problem in our children. Oh, I wish they could take this and I wish they could do that. And I wish this would happen. And I wish I could just press press a, a, a reprogram button and all this sort of stuff. The fact of the matter is we can't do that. Hey, parenting's not for the faint-hearted, amen? I tell you. We were with the Coons today. We took them out for lunch and we're sitting there and they've got young kids. You saw them this morning. They're running around all over the place and Melanie's pulling her hair out, sit down, and Tim's like sit down and all this sort of stuff. And I sat there and I thought for a minute, me, I'm glad the kids aren't little. But then I thought, hang on a second. They're adults and they still fuss and fight and carry on. And so I tried to be a blessing to Melody. I said, Melody, don't worry about it. They'll get to adults and they'll still carry on the the same way. They'll fuss and fight and tease and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, hey, just come and stay at our house for a little while. You see what I mean? But, uh, you know, they're like that. Kids are like that. And you wish that there were things that you could do for your children that you can't do, but only Jesus Christ can do it. So like this parent, he's battling with trouble with a troubled team. And we've got parents today that are distraught, they're desperate, and they're looking every in every direction for help. Probably the second bestseller of books at Kurong is those parenting books. You've got the, you've got the self-help uh, uh, spiritual books on uh, five steps to a greater successful Christian life and, and all those sorts of things. And I reckon the next best-selling books in Kurong would be the parenting books. Everyone wants to know, what's wrong with my child? Why isn't my child being obedient? Why is it? I tell you why, because it's a sin problem. <laughs> it's a sin problem. I believe that we are in an epidemic today of what psychiatry is calling disruptive behaviour disorder. 
Do you know one in ten children are so-called diagnosed with a disruptive disorder? Now let me just say this. Psychiatry has to have diagnosis to make their profession worthwhile. There is a book that they have that's about yay thick. And in that book is all these different terminologies of what they can classify children with. ADD. Attention Deficit Disorder. ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. As if the first one wasn't enough, we've got to add in Hyperactive Disorder. And then there's this one. ODD. Have you ever heard of ODD? That's a bit odd, isn't it? Well, let me tell you what that is. Oppositional Defiant Disorder. No, that's... Listen, it's out there. It's out there. And kids, listen. If this child were around today, he would be diagnosed with one or two or even three of the very most popular diagnoses today. ADHD, ODD, Opposition Defiant Disorder. How about this one? DMDD. Let me give you this one. Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. CD. And it's not what you put in your player. Conduct Disorder. SPD, sensory processing disorder, and they are but a few of what their children are being diagnosed with, and they are then prescribed one of about 45 different types of medications to try and fix the disorder. Now, if it's a disorder, there's only one person that can bring order to disorder, and his name is Jesus. Amen. But they want you to think that they've got something that uh, they've diagnosed them with and therefore they put them on to medication. Now let me just say this. Parents in Australia today have been duped into thinking that spanking their child is against the law. As a matter of fact, they make it very hard for parents today to spank their children. Because if you spank your child, they threaten you with abuse. Let me tell you why God made a very nice padded area at the rear end of our bodies. It takes a stick very well. And you can hit that place as often as you like because that's what it's meant for. If they are disruptive, they need a spank. But they teach you today that, well, he's got this sort of disorder. He's got uh, attention deficit. He cannot, his attention span is uh, only so big. And because he's got a small attention span and he's, oh my goodness, he's very hyperactive. Oh, hey, isn't that a normal child? I mean, how many kids are hyperactive today? How many kids have got a short attention span? And parents today are like, oh my goodness, my child has got no attention span. He can't sit still in front of the TV for more than five seconds. And he's jumping all over the place. Let's run down to the doctor. Oh, doctor, my child has got this problem. Oh, I know what it is. He's got ADHD. Here's some Ritalin. Here's some Ritalin. And by the way, you talk about some heavy drugs. Remember I spoke about mental health not too long ago and you've got Prozac and Valium and all those sorts. Of, do you know that they're also prescribed to children with a number, with a range of different diagnoses that the medical, medical fraternal is giving people today? Let me give you these verses. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth, loveth him chasteneth him betimes. In other words, quickly. Quickly. Um, hold your place here, please, in Mark. And I want you to go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes, I didn't have this down. I just thought about it and I'll see if I can find it. It is, a, it is very interesting because let me tell you something, folks. We are, living, we are living in a day... Uh, where are we? Oh, sorry, Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We, we are living in a day where we are having people that are put in uh, situations of authority who were the very beginnings of an era where you weren't allowed to discipline your child and you talk to them or you put them in a naughty corner and all this sort of stuff. And we are reaping, we're reaping the beginnings of them and we've got people that are in authority today that never experienced a good spanking because they were naughty. And so they're in positions of authority and now they're trying to make it that you can't spank them at all. These are people that have grown up in that sort of mindset. 
And we are going to have, and we already see it today, amen, we see it in teenagers today, we see it in young people, not just in unsaved Christian homes, but in Christian homes, uh-huh. right? Christian homes where they're disruptive, there's no disobedience, uh, there's disobedience, there's no discipline, there's no chastening, there's no spanking, and we're, we're getting a generation of people that are now growing up and they are just running wild, running wild. Have a look at this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Look at verse number 11, if you would. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Do you know what that verse is saying? If you don't deal with a situation in a child's life quickly, it's going to be set in their heart that they can get away with it and do evil. Following me? Do you see that there? That's why it's important that discipline is maintained in the home. Everything rises and falls on a sin nature problem. In Mark chapter 9, we see the child. Yes, he was demon possessed, just like the wild man at Gadara. But we look at that and we think, okay, how can I make application today? We've got a troubled teen. There's something wrong with him. And we look at the scriptures and we've got to understand today that all these disorders that are being diagnosed on children, very young children as well as teenagers today, can quite easily be fixed with salvation because every problem known to man stems from sin. But listen, psychiatry, psychologists, psychiatrists who deal with the psyche only want to think about the mind. They don't want to think about the spirit of man. But as Christians, we deal with the spirit, soul and the body. Amen. All right. The spirit, soul and the body. Now, listen to this verse in Proverbs twenty-two, fifteen: Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Robbie could probably quote there. This was the first verse. I got him to learn as he was growing up. (laughs) Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So the rod of correction is going to drive what from the heart of the child? Foolishness. Foolishness. How many times do we see today, and I, and I really feel sorry and pity the parent, you go through the shopping centres and the, the child is just throwing a spaz. I mean, he's just cutting loose and screaming, can't get his own way. And the poor old parent is like, oh no, come on now. And they're trying to reason with a child. You don't reason with children. As a matter of fact, the only reasoning they need is a quick spank on the backside and say, hey, listen, that behaviour is not acceptable. Now hang on, hang on, nearly done. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. The rod and reproof. The rod and reproof. So in other words, biblical discipline has the rod and reproof. What's the reproof? It's exposing what the child has done wrong. When our kids were little, we would sit down with, the, with our kids and we'd say, Now listen, you, you, let me just, not that this probably happened, I don't think. Now Robert... You're going to get a spank. You're going to get sick because you bit your sister. It's wrong to bite. Now, he never did that. I'm just using it. I don't think. Did you? No. It's wrong to bite. You shouldn't bite your sister. Now, it, you may not get the stick out straight away. Right? Because a child's like, well, I didn't know. Okay. But you know the difference now. You bite your sister, you're going to get a spank. So if he went and did it again, Robert... Did I not tell you not to bite your sister? Now I'm going to give you the stick. Because you did wrong. And because that is not done today, we have a generation of children growing up that think that they're entitled and they can get away with everything. And they can't. They can't. There is no restraint to the children anymore. Listen to this verse in 1 Samuel 3.13, dealing with Hophni and Phinehas and Eli. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he, that's the dad, restrained them not. Would you say that we are living in a day, Christian and non-Christian, now let's be honest, judgment must first begin at the house of God. Right? We are living in a day where there is no restraint. 
There's like the preacher was saying this morning, refusal, saying no, 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 you can't do that. No, you're not having that. Children don't like to hear no. They kick up, don't they, when they say no, you can't have that. Oh, and then off they go. And it's like the Bible says, spare not for their crying people. Just because the child is crying, listen, they're trying to get their own way. That's a sin nature. And if we do not restrain that, then they're going to grow up thinking, you know what, I'm just going to chuck a wobbly because I get whatever I want when I chuck a wobbly. And then they go into the workforce and they think that they can get their own way in the workforce because they can chuck a wobbly. But then they soon realise that, hey, it doesn't work like that. And then we've got, it's true, we have some dysfunctional teenagers and young adults out there because of this very thing. Now, like I said, the problem... At its core is a spiritual problem. Now listen, you can't fight a spiritual problem in a secular way. Did you hear me? You cannot fight a spiritual problem in a secular way. You can't take something that is a sin nature in a child and go and put secular practices in place. It doesn't work. You go to a spiritual solution for a spiritual problem. Amen. We are going to come to the time where we're going to have to take the verse. You remember when the disciples said, uh, you know, to obey God rather than man? You remember that? We ought to obey God rather than man. We are coming to that day now where we have to make a choice of whether we're going to obey God or man. And it's becoming more increasingly difficult for Christians today to practice biblical Christianity. Dysfunction and disorder is a result of sin. Before sin come into the world, there was no dysfunction. Amen. Before sin come into the world, there was no disorder. There was no chaos. Everything was perfect. And then sin entered into the world. And because of sin, we have all the problems we have today. Yet no one wants to recognize it in a general sense, in a worldly sense. We don't want to recognize that this is a sin problem because then the Christians might have had it right. We've had it wrong. And then they don't want to be made to look foolish. But that doesn't mean we have to stick our head in the sand and think, you know what, yeah, yeah, it's a sin problem, but uh, oh my goodness, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, there is. You put the Bible into practice. When I shared with one of the ladies in the church that spanking was still a biblical practice, her children laughed at her and said, you can't do that. Because they're being taught that in school. They're being taught. Authority is being taken out of the home and hand it over to somebody else. I was sharing with Brother John Gadeen this morning. I watched a documentary with Tracy yesterday. Do you know that psychiatry or psychologists are the only people who can legally lock somebody up without any explanation because they've deemed that person uh, incapable of living in society? Yes, psychiatry. Because they think, well, there's a problem with the mind now and we're going to lock this person up and we're going to subject their life to a life of drugs. And, uh, and by the way, we're not sure whether this works, but we'll try it. And if it doesn't work, we've got this one and then we've got this one. And all these sorts of things are going on in the, in the life of not just adults, but children, people. Children are being exposed to all these sorts of things. And we've got distraught parents everywhere looking for direction, but they're looking everywhere except the main area, and that's the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ. All through the Bible, folks, we see dysfunctional families. Adam and Eve. Cain kills his brother. That's dysfunction. Why? Jealousy, sin. What about, uh, we go on further, what about Jacob and Esau? Dysfunction. What about Joseph and his brothers? And by the way, with Jacob and Esau and Joseph and the brothers, there was favoritism in the family. Dysfunctional families have always been a part of society. Why? Because sin came into the world and death by sin. It's not just a salvation thing, folks. Sin affected every area of mankind. And just because somebody gets saved, it doesn't mean necessarily straight away their life's going to be turned around. Aren't you glad for salvation? My spirit got saved. I'm a new creature in Christ. 
but now I've got to grow in the Lord and I've got to learn and I've got to, I, I've got to train my mind to how the Bible thinks and how God thinks and put into practice the scriptures and we've got to teach our children, train up a child in the way that they should go. And yet the world wants to make us look like fools because we want to teach our children. You can't teach your... That's brainwashing. (laughs) Well, hang on a second. What do you think you're doing with the safe school programs down there in Melbourne when you're taking that rubbish into the school and brainwashing children into thinking you can be transgender, you can be this, you can be that. Whatever you choose, you can be. Oh, I'm going to choose to be a, uh, uh, an elephant today. Oh, you could be an elephant. If you're an elephant, you could be... That. Now, you talk about mental retardation, that's it yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. You can be whatever you want to be. No, you can't. You are who God created you to be. Amen. Male, female. Amen. I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Someone might listen on YouTube and then I'll probably get into trouble, but that's all right. <laughs> Listen to this verse in Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. What is the Bible saying there? Now, let me, let me take the last part of that verse. A city that is broken down and without walls is, number one, dysfunctional. And number two, it's not protected. Right? So a city has to have walls to function and to be protected. So God is telling us, if you have no rule, no control over your spirit, you are going to be a dysfunctional, unprotected person. So what do we have to teach? We have to teach our children to live correctly and how to handle different things. And and really, most problems in our life, yes, it stems from sin, but there is an inability of parent and children today to handle different things that come across their path. The child is used to getting everything that it wants and then it meets someone who's not going to give them everything that they want and then they just, what is going on? And they have a meltdown. Oh, he's got ADHD, ODD, CBD, whatever they, you know, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, D. Just put a, just put a alphabet to it. You'll be right. We'll give them some Ritalin and we'll give them some Prozac. We'll give them some of this and, and we'll make them all like I was talking about with the, the mental health. We're going to have them walk them through the halls of our hospitals just like comatose. This is happening to kids. Where there is no control, things are out of control. And I would say things are desperately out of control today, generally speaking, in the Australian household. Right? Now, we would think, okay, the world, they don't know Jesus Christ, they don't have, they don't have the Saviour, they don't have a church, they don't have a Bible-preaching church. We would expect that in the world. But folks, let me say this, as I said, forget the world. It is a rampant problem in our churches today. There's no discipline, there's no correction, there's no restraint. And kids are running wild. Let's go back to Mark, if you would please. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Now let me just say this, I'm glad there's an answer, but can I just also add to this? Nothing comes easy. Honestly, we've got to, we've got to get out of our head that everything just can't, can come at the click of a finger. You have to work at your own Christianity. You have to work at raising your children. You have to be firm but loving. You have to be corrective. You have to be a a disciplinarian. You you can't be your child's mate for all their life. You know what I mean? It's like, now Robert's 19. He he is my mate. But when when they were growing up, they're not my mates. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are children that need training. They are children that need discipline. They are children that just need uh, rebuking time and time again. And they need to know that because there are boundaries in life that if they don't know that, they overstep the boundaries. And is it any wonder that we are seeing a multitude of Christian teenagers going away from God and going into drugs and sex and alcohol and multiple relationships and all this? Why is it happening? And then the parents are distraught and seeking help. What, what can we do? What can we do? Notice in our passage that we read in verse number 21, in verse number 21, Jesus now says to the father, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. 
let me give you the first thing that needs to happen. Questions need to be asked. Questions need to be asked. You know, we live today, as I said, with all these teenagers and children battling and having problems, but nobody asks questions anymore. How long ago? When did this happen? And tracing it back to the root problem before anything can be fixed. In an unsaved child's life, they've got to get to the age of accountability where they understand that they are a sinner and need saving. Amen. Right? But just because they're saved, it doesn't mean that they're going to be angels. <laughs> we know that. We know that. So if there, is a, if there is a problem with a child, you have to ask questions. And let me just say this. If you're going to ask a question... You ask a question of a pastor, or even if you ask God a question, it's all right to ask God questions, amen, as long as you're not asking, it's like, oh God, why is this happening? But you can ask God questions, it's all right. Jesus asked the Father, why? If you ask God a question as to why, you better accept the response or the answer he gives you. Most people don't want to know the real reason as to why. Especially when it comes to parenting because they don't want to think, we don't want to think we're bad parents, right? We all want to think we're pretty good parents. I'm not a good parent. I wish I was a good parent. You ask my kids. You know, children are a window to the home. Is that right? Children are a window to the home. If you see a child out in public just running amok, you think, my goodness, what is that child like at home? Right? Now, if we do it right and we train our children, when they're in public, they're just a blessing. <laughs> and how many times have you taken the kids out and someone might come out, well, they're very well behaved, and you think, oh, good. <laughs> see what they're like at home. <laughs> You would rather the child out in public behaving themselves, right? And if they disbehave at home, then you can apply the rod of correction while you're at home. You know, if you're, if the, if you're out, you know, and you're saying to your kid, listen, um, you're going to get it when you get home. I'm going to make sure you follow through with that too, by the way. Amen. All right, follow through with it. Don't, like, get home and the, the event, oh, no, it's okay. Listen, just don't do it again because they're going to cotton onto that. Mum, right. Mum and Dad don't really do it. They just say it. They're all talk. They're all talk. But ask questions. Jesus said, how long ago has this been with, with your son? And he said this, as of a child. Do you mean to say he got demon possessed when he was a child? How is that so? And, and the Bible doesn't give us any insight. I wish it did. So all we can say is that we can make some assumptions and we could probably say that perhaps the child was exposed to something at a young age that they shouldn't have been exposed to because how can a young child now let me just say this how is someone born again they're born again by realizing they're a sinner and they ask Jesus Christ to save them and they get the Holy Spirit right correct how is someone demon possessed and a child get demon possessed because they, they must have been around something and exposed to something that they got possessed with. So let me just say this. As parents, we have to be very vigilant as to what we expose our children to. Amen. Now, our kids are adults, right? They, we have, according to the scriptures, we have done our job. Robert's 19, he's 20 this year, and me, he's 25, and Carly's, what is she, 22, and of course Jennifer's off and married. We, we, we brought up our kids, they're, at, they're, they're, at, they're adults now. They are accountable to God themselves. Though they live at home, there is accountability there, and as parents, we, we did the best we could at minimising wrong exposure. You know the biggest, now let me just say this, when they were little, we didn't expose them to things like um, uh, Harry Potter. 
We didn't expose them to. Well, what are some other things? Help me. Huh? Oh, well, they were probably a bit older when Lord of the Rings come out. But let me just say this. When a child is that young, they cannot handle that. If they watched Harry Potter now, that's up to them. They're adults. Correct? They may be able to handle something like that and think, well, you know, yeah, witchcraft is real and so on and so forth, but we know it's a film, blah, 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 blah. They know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm not saying they go out and do that. I'm using it as an example, right? Movies, music. Music is probably one of the biggest things in homes today, Christian and non-Christian, where there is a wrong spirit that comes in with that. We have, we have tried to do our best at, at studying and researching music and songs. And I grew up in the 80s. You grew up in the, the 80s. No one wants to admit growing up in the 80s. Maybe some of you grew up in the, 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 ni- the 90s. <laughs> Can I just say this without, without sounding carnal? The 80s were the best decade of music and the worst. <laughs> <laughs> You know, confession is good for the soul. I was a little bit backslidden in the 80s, and so, you know, there was some music that came out that I don't listen to today, but if they played it 20, 30 odd years later, I could be walking through the shops and I can pick it up just like that. Just like that. How powerful and subliminal is music? And if you were to do research on music, and we don't, we we can't tonight. But you know, when when King Saul was troubled by an evil spirit, what was it that drove the evil spirit away? Music Music that was played by David. Do you just think that David would have played godly sounding music? Do you think that would be the case? So then the question is this, if, if godly music, if good music played by a godly young man drove a bad spirit away, if I introduced bad, ungodly music into the home, what sort of spirit will that bring? There you go. There you go. But you see, parents don't want to hear that today. They, don't, they think that you're controlled. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I've got no right to control your home. Mm-hmm. Right? I have, enough, I have enough on my plate with my home and being a pastor, don't we? Pastor Marsh and I. Amen. We, we can... We can, uh, we can have... We can, how can I say um, we can govern what should happen in the church right we're on the same for example we're on the same page as pastors if someone's going to preach we'd like them to have a shirt and tie that's just our preference that's just what we want we, we want the preacher the teacher whoever to look presentable that's, that's us it's not a you know it's just who we are um, but I can't dictate to you to say you have to come dressed a certain way but we can say what sort of platform standard we want. Yes. So when it comes to your home, right, fathers, men, right, you're the authority in the home, you dictate and govern what happens in your home. Amen. You have the authority in your home. I have no right to ex- ex- exert your authority in the home. Right. So therefore, if there is something, remember I said children are a window to the home? Let, let me use this illustration of modesty. If, if a daughter or a mother is immodest, the problem is not with them, the problem is with the father. Because the dad has allowed them to be like that. Come on, see? Nobody wants the truth. Nobody, you ask the question and be ready for the answer. The problem is not the preacher. Well, preacher, you're not preaching it hard enough. No, no, dad, you're the problem because you allow the daughters or the mother to dress like harlots and go out there looking like prostitutes. You're the problem. Get some guts in your Christianity. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So when it comes to the home and what you watch and what you allow in and what you expose your children to, that's your responsibility. What I do in my home may be a bit different to what you do in your home. Mm-hmm. I may let my kids watch something now that you... Look, they're adults now, but let's say they were teenagers. We might have let our kids watch something that you might not let your kids watch. Well, that's okay. That's your rules. That's your home. Mm-hmm. 
Right. My rules, my home. But if there's something happening in my home because there's a dysfunction disorder in my home, there's a deficit disorder in my home, and my kids are hyperactive, my kids are acting up and, and acting out and angry and, and all this sort of stuff, then I've got to check a couple of things in my home. Movies I'm watching, music I'm watching, and video games I'm letting them play. Yes. That's right. Okay? There is a game that I will not allow into my house, and Robbie knows what it is, and that is, uh, uh, tell me what it is. There we go, Grand Theft Auto. I will not let, if I find it in my home, it's out. It's pretty disgusting. It is, it, it has, it, it's got, uh, oh, anyway, won't, won't go any, <laughs> it's bad. It is, it is teaching kids, it is role playing. Now this is, this is, let me tell you how it happens, right? Kids will listen. I went and got my hair cut the other day. I'm going all over. I'm getting all excited. I got my hair cut the other day down at the Gold Coast. I went and got pampered. I went in there and I got a haircut and I got a proper shave. You know how you sit in the chair and they... I said, I want a shave. I've always, I've always wanted one of those. You like that? Yeah. And you sit there and they put the hot towel on and they lather you up and then they shave and you can hear it. It's like, oh man, this is just life. And then they did your eyebrows and everything and come out looking, woohoo! You know? <laughs> But while I was in there, the music that was being played was the rap music, and I kid you not, every song had it, it had the F expletive in there. Mm-hmm. Man, a lie. How wild is that? So it could be you have to ask some questions. See, the doctors don't say, and I'll just use this as an example, um, what music do you have in your home? Uh, this is, <laughs> between you and mum, all right? Just, this is, I'm, just pretend, all right? Uh, let me just, let me go to the bar. What music do you have at home? What, what movies are you allowing your child to watch? What, they don't ask questions like that. Oh, your kid's acting out, they've got ADHD. Oh, what do I do for that? Oh, here's some ribbon. There it is. Yeah. If they don't ask, what video games you play, because then if it's the violence in the video games, and the video game is the problem, and then you've got the snowball effect, mm-hmm. and then there's and all that sort of stuff. So you've got to ask questions and expose it. Secondly, have a look at this. Look at verse 20 and 22, and we see the destructive nature that's exposed here. Verse number 20 and 22. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. In my Bible, in the back of my Bible, it's got all the miracles of the Lord. Do you know what this miracle is called as? The, the, the healing of the epileptic boy. That's what it's titled in the back of my Bible. So what we're seeing here is a case of epilepsy. This is what people would diagnose. It. Oh, they've got epilepsy or they've got this or they've got that. Verse 22, and oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us. Let's go back up a little bit. Have a look at verse number 18. And wheresoever he, this is the spirit, taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and he pineth away. This is all that this is what's exposed here by this child that's been that's got this spiritual problem. He's, he's, a, he's no doubt he's a problematic child. He's a, he's a troubled child. To that there is no question. And we look at what's taking place here and we see this destructive nature and we say, what, what can we do about that? I, I can't stop my child from pining away. I can't stop him from gnashing his teeth. I can't stop him from punching holes in the wall. What's going on? And then you've got to, you've got to ask the Lord, can you show me, Lord, what's going on? And when he reveals that, deal with it. But in the meantime, when they're wrecking your furniture, spank them. Man alive, don't let them get away with murder. So destructive nature is exposed. And I want to get on to this last one and we'll be done. Look at verse number 23 and 29. We see the solution to the spiritual problem. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The fathers cried out. The parents come to him and said, Lord, help us. Help us. Okay, first thing, do you believe? Do you believe that, that I can help? You know, that's a pretty uh, confronting question right there, isn't it? We look at this verse and we think, wow, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And we think, wow, what a verse that is. 
But do we really believe that Jesus can help in any situation? Look at verse number 29. And he said unto them, this kind, this kind of problem, this kind of trouble, this kind of spirit can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So, yes, here's, here's the solution. Number one, do you believe? Because all things are possible to the one that believes. Do you believe I'm able to help you? The Lord Jesus would say to us, do you believe I'm able to help you? Yes, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Have you ever felt like that? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe, but strengthen my belief. And then the disciples said, why couldn't we cast him out? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. I'm wondering how many parents today pray and fast for their kids. Prayer and fasting. In the Bible, you know, it's still a New Testament principle, by the way, to fast. Amen. You see it all through the scriptures. But really, it's, it's something that's not taught a lot today. When you look at fasting, you see, you see different uh, amounts of fasting. All right? Fasting is denying the flesh. You deny the flesh of food. You can deny it of, of, of whatever pleasures. All right? There's three-day fast. Who here, who here has fasted before? Anyone actually ever fasted properly? I mean, I'm talking about proper fast. Okay. Man, day one, it's all right, isn't it? Day one, it's, oh, by the end of day one, I'm getting a bit headachey and so forth. Day two, it's like, whoa. Day three, and then there's 21-day there's fast, and you do seven-day fast, 40-day fast, all this sort of stuff. People who fast, if you look at it in the Bible, people who fast, they fast for a reason. It's not just a weight loss, by the way. It's not just a weight loss program. I don't think ice cream is... Uh... <laughs> it's a liquid. It's a liquid. <laughs> that was funny when you told me that. It's like, ice cream? Like, yeah, let, it, let it soften and let it go, you know. Uh, they fasted for a reason. If they needed answers, they needed deliverance, they needed help with something, God's people went to fasting. Because it showed God they were serious. And when you look at it, fasting is a humbling of oneself before God. And so, so when, the, when Jesus said to the disciples, this kind can come forth. This problem can, be a, this problem can be solved. There's no such thing as a hopeless situation with God. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. And Jesus says this, listen, prayer and fasting. Yes, I can do it, but you've got a role to play in this thing. You've got to do something. You've got to believe for your child. You've got to pray and fast for your child. I'm having troubles with my child. They're, 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 they've got this and they're doing this and they're running away and they're doing all sorts of stuff. Hey, pray and fast. You'll be amazed. There's probably testimony after testimony of things that happen through prayer and fasting. Interesting in the context of what we're saying here, we're talking about a spiritual fight. You gain power and authority in the spirit realm through prayer and fasting. That's right. Because remember, it all comes back to a spiritual problem. Every problem, every problem that I've encountered, I know about you preacher, every, every parent that I've gone to see that's got problems with their child always traces back to a spiritual problem. Always. Because all those things that I mentioned, whether it's music, movies, games or whatever, they affect the spirit of a person. Not just the mind, they affect the spirit. They watch something and they see it. And you know what happens? They go the next step of not just watching it happen. They role play it, they, they premeditate it and then they go out and do it. They go out and do it. So the solution is prayer and fasting. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, if you want to write that down, in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it talks about couples coming together to pray and fast, that they're not tempted of the devil. In 1 Peter 3, in verse number 7, the Bible says, for men to honour their wives, and it goes on that their prayers be not hindered. So there's got to be unity in the home. Right? Unity in the home. You, you've got to be on the same page as parents together in this thing. And I know for single parents, it's, it's tougher because you're fighting the battle alone. You're fighting the battle alone. 
But let me just say, you've, you've got to through the prayer and fasting where you get strength to stand and having done all to stand. You've got to face this thing. And, and there would be less kids on drugs. And I'm talking about prescription drugs and becoming addicted to prescription drugs. There would be less kids on those drugs in Christian homes if this sort of thing would be put in practice. Honestly, believe that. You know, the first time, and I'll close with this, the first time that I heard about Ripland, I was working at a transport company in Adelaide. And I was working with a guy who was an ex-bikey and transport industries full of those sorts of guys. He was a nice fella. And uh, he, yeah, he was telling me about his kid being diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, and he's on Ripplin. And he's like, oh. He said, man, that thing is really good. He says, I even take it. He, he wasn't even... Do- and the thing is, is Ripplin... Do you know what Ripplin is? Ripplin is speed. Mm. Speed. You know, the drug that you take to go, woohoo, you know, go flat out and like truckies take it all sorts. Why? Because they can get this high and just go, go, go. So in someone who, who like this fella, he would take his kid's drugs to give him a high. But hang on a second, you've got a hyperactive child and you're giving him speed? What's the deal with that? See, they don't really know, folks. They don't. Anyway, we're not going to go into all of that. But there's too many distraught parents and troubled teens. Mm. And we're, we're, we're fast coming to a day where it, it's, it's, it's getting worse and worse. And our governments are going to be run by people who have never been correctly now disciplined. There's a wrong way to do it. We all, we all agree there's a right and a wrong way, okay? To do it correctly, read the Bible, you know how to do it, right? But we are, we are coming to a generation where they're used to getting what they want. They've never had boundaries put in their life. They, they're just out there. They run rampant. Check the schoolies out. Schoolies week. Check that out. Look, when you go, you know, on the news, see all these kids running rampant, doing whatever they want to do, just because they finished year 12 and going down to wherever, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, or where it is, and running amok and causing havoc and breaking stuff and killing themselves and doing all sorts. Where are, the, where are the parents? Well, the authority's been taken out of the home because you're not allowed to do certain things to those children anymore because those kids have rights. Well, that's another topic right there. Another topic right there. But listen, there is a solution. His name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. All right, don't, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk in the counsel of the word of God. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. We thank you for these accounts in the scriptures that we can look at and learn from it. And we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen every person here in this area, God, whether they've got older kids, younger kids, no kids, whatever. Lord, just help us to understand and strengthen us, strengthen us in these days. And God, we just want to say thank you. We've had a wonderful day. And Lord, pray that you would just bless the remainder of the week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Make sure you get around and make David feel welcome. It's a blessing to have you.